Section 1.2 Materials from Biomass. Now this is an environmentally aware section of the HSC. It's predicated on the idea that oil is running out and that at some point in humanity's future we're going to need to get everything we get from oil from other substances. And it's also environmentally friendly because it's looking at ways to move away from using oil anyway, even if we don't run out of it. The idea is that oil is a substance that can cause a lot of damage to the environment, both through direct pollution and carbon dioxide and its effects on global warming. So the, the hunt is on for another source of all the things that we get from oil. The first thing to look at is biomass as an alternative to petrochemicals in terms of the products that we derive from petrochemicals. Biomass is a general term for the constituent products that make up biological life, be it animal, plant or microbial. There are chemical processes that can convert biomass into useful chemical products and substitutes for those products that we currently get from petrochemicals. Products from petrochemicals are currently used incredibly widely, from fuels to building materials, to clothing and electronics and much more. The economy couldn't really function as it does now without these products. Therefore, it's important to develop an alternative source for the products currently derived from petrochemicals and biomass is one a promising example of such an alternative source. For the HSC, you need to know about a particular biopolymer. You need to know how it's produced, what it's used for, all these sorts of things. Now you can choose any one biopolymer from a few different ones that you can find materials for. It's a pretty arbitrary choice. I think the easiest one to study is a biopolymer called PHB. PHB, its uh, full name is polyhydroxybutyrate. Butanoate, rather. Now, all the biopolymers are quite complex. So they've all got quite complex names. Now, PHB is a naturally occurring biopolymer. It's used by the bacterium Alcalogens eutrophus to store energy when that bacteria thinks it might starve. And that bacteria is placed in a situation where uh, it seems, uh, from the feedback that the bacteria is getting, that it might starve. It then produces PHB in response in order to store energy. In much the same way that the human body will store fat uh, for future famines, uh, this particular bacterium, which is called alcalogenes eutrophus, now it will store this PHB uh, in much the same way that uh, the human body might store fat as a future store of energy that it can then draw on. So by growing and feeding a big colony of these bacteria and then suddenly withdrawing all the glucose that we were feeding it before, we can induce the production of PHB. Now, an even better way of doing it is to transfer the genes out of uh, a calogenous eutrophus into another bacterium which is known as E. coli. Uh, Escherichia coli, and the reason that that's a, a good way of doing it is because E. coli is much easier to grow, and we've got a lot more experience with E. coli. E. coli is a very common bacterium that's been very well studied, so we know how to make it grow fast very easily. But either way, you produce a lot of the bacterium in question, and then suddenly withdraw its glucose, and it will produce this PHB which can then be harvested. Now once that's harvested, it can be used in the following ways. On the one hand, PHB is very similar to uh, polypropylene. So it can be used as a substitute for polypropylene. It's not very similar at all chemically to polypropylene, but its physical properties 
are similar. So it can be used as a substitute for polypropylene in some of the cases where polypropylene is used. Another use for it <laughs> takes advantage of the fact that PHB is biocompatible. Because it's biocompatible, and what that means is that it it doesn't cause infections, it uh, it doesn't annoy the body, it doesn't cause allergies or some kind of immune reaction. It can just sit next to biological components in in our bodies and not cause any problems. So because it's biocompatible, it can be used in the medical industry. And it's currently used as a kind of medical suture that doesn't need to be removed. It'll safely degrade over time. So it's a way of stitching someone up and then not having to go in and remove those stitches afterwards, which if the suture is inside the body, it's very, very useful because that would require another round of surgery, which can be expensive and dangerous. So it's biodegradable and biocompatible suture, which is very useful use that it's actually currently being manufactured and used for. Now, the pros in terms of using it, which you may well need to talk about, you may need to talk about what's good about using this and what's bad about using it. The pros are that it's renewable, it's non-toxic, uh, it's biodegradable, it's biocompatible, and these are all very environmentally friendly and positive things about for for a poly, for a polymer substitute for a petrochemical polymer substitute that's fantastic the con the big con uh rather is that it's very expensive compared to conventional petrochemical polymers just because those petrochemical polymers are so cheap so petroleum based polymers are just so cheap PHP is very expensive and at the moment it's not economic for everything except those medical sutures that we've already mentioned. So that's how it stands at the moment. However, of course, if oil did start to run out, oil would become more expensive and could potentially overcome this problem. So that's one possible biopolymer that we could use. The rest of this dot point deals with cellulose and its production from glucose and its possible use. Cellulose is another biopolymer that already naturally exists. It can't be used in the exact same way. First we're going to look at how it's produced and then we're going to talk a bit about its future uh, as a potentially useful biomass product. So let's look at the production of this biopolymer inside plants. Cellulose is a condensation polymer. That means is that the reaction that forms cellulose ejects an H2O molecule. The H2O molecule, which is of course a water molecule, is said to condense out. And what that means is it's a bit different to the addition polymer uh, that we were looking at in section 1.1. It's a different kind of reaction. Now this is something that goes on inside plants when they're building their cell walls and in a few other contexts in biological organisms. But the process is that two glu glucoses uh, come together in the plant and then condensation reaction is catalyzed by the plant's own biological processes. What happens is the OH from one of the glucoses and H from the other glucose join together. They come out as an H2O and what we're left with is an O join between the two cellular between the two glucose molecules. And this process is repeated at either end of the glucose they join onto more until you've got thousands and thousands of these glucose molecules joined together into a cellulose structure. So when thousands and thousands of glucoses are joined 
by these O bonds, so that's an oxygen, which just joins between the two, that's a cellulose molecule. Now cellulose is a very, very common molecule in nature. It's in the cell walls of all plants and it makes up the bulk of biomass in the world. It contains both carbon and hydrogen. So it's a suitable precursor for the production of petrochemicals. The problem is that cellulose is not very biologically available. It's very difficult to extract the carbon and the hydrogen out of the cellulose. There's a lot of oxygen in there, there's a lot of bonds to break to get to the carbon and hydrogen. So it's still very uneconomic to convert cellulose into hydrocarbons, these kinds of useful products that, that we would want. At the moment it's just too easy to get oil out of the ground and use that for our petrochemical needs and not even worry about cellulose which is seen as a waste product. Much agricultural and forestry waste is rich in cellulose and that presents an opportunity because it would be an environmentally and economically viable source in the future if we began to run out of oil. So that's the pro, is that there's a lot of it around and that it's renewable, it's already a waste product. However, if demand for petrochemical substitutes outstripped this potential supply from farming and from agriculture and forestry waste, Cellulose could be produced agriculturally, so we could grow crops specifically to produce cellulose. However, that requires land that might otherwise be used simply to produce food, which means that our desire for petrochemicals would make food more expensive and less affordable for poorer people. And that's section 1.2.